study on new creation realities. And this one is really, really, really something that God wants me to give to you and encourage you in. It's called Empowered Ambassadors. The Bible says that you and I are ambassadors of Christ or for Christ. Now, an ambassador is somebody that the one sending the ambassador has to believe in. Okay, this is really good for you to just kind of take notes on this. You see, the Father ha it, it knows that when we accept Jesus Christ, we become ambassadors of him and, and Jesus and of the Holy Spirit. That's the Godhead. Amen. But when he chooses us to represent him, he wants us to know enough so that we, when we talk about God, we're not confusing anybody. Come on, smile up at me. So we need to know that there are certain things about God that are true and other things out there that's kind of like religious teaching. Amen. And a lot of times, a lot of Christians that kind of put them all into a little box and jiggle them all up and start trying to share Christ. Well, you get a good educated you know, person that's been to college or something, and you start telling them, oh, God's going to, if you don't turn your life over on him, he's going to beat the tar out of you, and he's going to make you, and you start sharing things that's not right. You know, first thing I like to tell people is, if you had a sickness that you couldn't cure, that you tried everything, you went to doctors, you went and you checked everything, and they really can't tell you what it is, but you have a sickness that, that you, no one could cure. And you heard some good news. You heard there was someone that's getting absolutely 100% results on everybody that he touches. Now, wouldn't you make preparation if you have that disease to do everything that you could to get to him or to find out what he's doing? Correct? Well, see, Adam... Because of his sin and fall, his disobedience to God received a disease. The disease is the nature of Satan called sin. Without an S, sin. It's the nature of Satan. The author of sin is Satan, not God. God didn't make sin so you and I could suffer. Satan created sin because he became what God was not. God is light. In him is no darkness at all. So Satan, when he fell, he became darkness, sin, right? So when Adam and Eve ate of that tree, it wasn't just a disobedience to God. It was something that Satan messed with the tree. Now listen to me very careful. If you get a chance, we're going to read it. When you find out and you read in chapter 2 of Genesis, it says when God finished giving and making everything, what did he say? He said everything was very come on, repeat it after me. Everything was very Good. And then he says something real strange. He says, if all the trees in, of the garden, you may eat thereof. And there's a tree of life and in, in the midst of the garden. And there's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat it. Now, if everything that God planted is very good, why would God say, don't eat this one? Because you remember there was an outlaw that tried to attack the God from this earth before Adam and Eve was created, thrown back on the earth. The Samaritans called them Anunnaki. But really, they were the fallen angels. Every nation of the world in their mythos or their stories, mythologies, talk about these creatures that came down from heaven. Now, we already know the false teaching. I have to cover this, okay? So bear with me. False teaching is uh, an extra supernatural alien race came, loved our planet. They decided to be here and they made man in a test tube. Taking the, the, the animals of the earth and the, the, all the, and they made their Cro-Magnums and their, their Anthropisicuses and all that kind of stuff. You know, it all sounds scientific. But if you think of it, God, everything God does is what? Good and? Oh, it's in James. Come on, every good and perfect gift comes from God. Amen. So if it's not good and perfect, somebody else did it. Amen. Smile up at me and say, God is perfect. God is perfect. Always perfect concerning Always. me. 
Anything else that's not perfect, you have, to, you have to sort it out. That's why he gives us the word. Are you with me? So the first three, everyone say the first three. We call God the first three beings that ever existed. Somebody says, well, who created them? When you get there, you can ask God. They always were. They always will be. There are three of them. Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. Now, the Word became flesh, so now it's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Come on, you Old Testament people. So those three are God. In the New Testament, they're called the Godhead. Not three separate gods. One entire unit with the Father, His Son, that the Word that became flesh, and the Holy Spirit. Those three are God. Everything else was created by God. Say, created by God. Now, when God created everything in the beginning, was it perfect? Yes. All right. So now you know Satan's the author of evil, sin, and he messed with that tree. Why would God, if he made everything good, very good, say, now children, don't go over there. Now, Jimmy, don't go out there in the freeway and play baseball. Why not? That's, see, what happens is when the people got a hold of the world, they dumbed it down, of the word. They got a hold of the word and kind of dumbed it down. What God probably said in the Hebrew, you touch that, you're going to die. You're going to get cursed. You're going to act like the devil, which we hate. But they dumbed it down a little bit and says, in eating it, you will surely die. Now, did God, one more question, then we'll get into this. Did God purpose for us to die? No. We were always made to live forever. Now, your spirit and your soul will live forever. Your body will go to the dust. That's why God gives you a new body. That's why we follow him. Because he promises at the resurrection or the rapture, both the same, part of the same thing. He'll going to change you in a moment in a twinkling eye. You're going to be swallowed up into victory. Mortal will put on immortality and death will be swallowed up in total victory. Satan hates that. So he's harassing you. He will tell you all kinds of lies. That's why a good teaching like this will help you find out. Now, are you an ambassador? Yes. So we need to know how an ambassador functions. All right, so let's look at our scripture today as we get it up. Now, Jesus anointed his 70 disciples. Remember, they were the 12, then the 70, and then there were a multitude of disciples. There was the inner core, the outer core, and then all the disciples, and then people came to hear Jesus. But all of them came to Jesus except for the original 12. So here he anointed them, he appointed them, but look what they said. Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. We're going to be talking about the birthright of a human being. Didn't Jesus anoint these men? They were so amazed that the devils left them alone. Who lives in you? Why do you have the enemies harassing you still? Good point, huh? Okay. And he said to them, these are, this is Old Testament, folks. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Hey, when did that happen? See, a lot of Christians can't. Before Adam and Eve was created, God threw him out of heaven. Remember? Ezekiel 28. Ezek, uh, excuse me, Isaiah 14. There you go. I behold, I threw him out, fell like lightning out of heaven. Behold, look, I give you authority to trample on who? Serpents and scorpions and over all. How much? All the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. This is Old Testament. Who do you have in your heart now? Yes, scripture says, even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil. The Old Testament says, for you are with me. New Testament says, for you are in me. You see, what happens to a Christian is they get born again, turn everything over to God. It's glorious. And then we start taking back control. 
We don't mean to, but we start taking back control, making decisions and stuff. And then all of a sudden we find our, now listen carefully, we find ourselves under attack because it's us making the decisions and making the decisions without praying to God and asking for his favor. God will give you favor on it. I'd rather have him helping me with a project than me trying to do it myself and trying to fend off the enemy. Do you understand? Your life is much more value, valuable than any project you do. Your testimony, you are an ambassador. So you need to learn to wear God's equipment. You need to learn to speak right. So that when the power of God moves and you move into an area where they need to hear about God, you are God's choice. God chooses you to represent him. Remember, an ambassador is chosen by the one they're ambassadors of. Like if you're an ambassador of the United States. They have to choose you, see that your character's right. And then they send you out and back everything you say. Did you know God wants to back everything you say? Isn't that just killing you? I neutralize that. You understand what I'm saying? Every idol word. You, see, most people, we make God religious. He's not religious. He wants to teach you the very principles of how to live and walk and talk. Like he did when he was here as a man. He's our example. He didn't teach his disciples. Now, guys, I'm going to teach you how to be religious. Go to church faithfully, pay your tithes, and do all those things. Nothing wrong with all those things. But no, he was teaching them how to apply, what to say, what not to say, how to interact with people. First thing he said to the boys is, is if you want to follow me, notice I call them the boys. They became men later. He says, if you want to follow me, first got to deny yourself. Oh, right there throughout two-thirds of the body of Christ. My goodness, you only come to church when you want to. Or if you're in the mood, come on, I'm just, you know, just generally speaking. Because that's what Satan wants. He wants you to be a moody Christian. You're fluctuating on things, offended, non-offended. So he can kind of control that. Kind of like a puppet master. But not so with you. You follow God. Can you say amen? You meet with God and die to yourself. So guess what? Satan can't lie to a dead person. Smile at somebody, look behind you and say, you look a little dead to me. <laughs> you mean it in a joy. Really, you can't insult a dead person. The whole purpose of God's principles is not for us to be religious with them. It's to understand that when we go to meet God, the first thing is we lay aside our body. We ask God to crucify it. Romans 6 says, if we believe that we are baptized in Christ, born again, then we're also buried with him in baptism. Are you with me? Nevertheless, let's finish it up. Do not rejoice that the devils are subject to you. That this is what we rejoice in. That the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice that your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Let me ask you. Here's one that will blow you away. When was your... Don't holler it out. Please be... Let everybody think about it for a minute. Sometimes you want to be first in line and then you find out it's only carrots. <laughs> Moving right along. Amen. See that last phrase? When was your name written down on the Lamb's book of life? Now, sit and listen to what God's telling you. When was your name written? Okay, who wants to shoot out first other than... Those who heard this for years. When we were born. That's a pretty good answer. Okay. Anybody else? Say that one more time. When we were saved. That's a good answer too. Both of them are kind of right, but not right. In the womb. Very good answer, but not true. Okay. Here's my wife. Honey. Oh, Danny. He said, he said, now not Danny, but God says, I knew you before the creation and the foundation of the world. In other words, he knew Sherry in Adam before Adam was created. 
And if you want to read more about how he looks at us, and this is very important because we don't get this a lot of times. We get the judgment and God's going to judge America. We're going to do this and we're going to do that. You know, the Bible says that's not for you to know the times and the season where the father's kept in his own power. He said, I want you to go to Jerusalem and wait for you being endued with power so you could be a good witness of me and keep your eyes off the world as passing away. Your name was written down before you were born. God knew you in purpose and plan. So in Ephesians chapter 1, right around verse 5, hope you're writing it down, it says that God predestined us before the foundation of the world that we would be before him in love, a kind of God creature. Okay, that was his purpose and plan for us. Now, we know that got interrupted, didn't we? Adam cr created an aid of something that interrupted the plan, but God never gave up on us. See, one thing that was hidden in the Old Testament that's revealed in the New Testament is God never leaves us nor forsakes us. In the Old Testament, they didn't know a loving God, remember? They knew a fierce God, a hard God, same God we have. But because they were not saved, because they didn't have God dwelling in them, they had to serve God out of fear. Because they had something in their flesh like all of us have, that you and I should crucify daily, is our flesh that wants to do its own thing, wants to worship its own gods, and wants to make its own decisions. Look at your neighbor and say, Woo, not me. <laughs> You know, you know, we all wrestle with that. I'm not, it's not a put down. It's just the truth. All right, so let me go ahead now. Let's get into our lesson. Empowered ambassadors. So good morning to you. May the God of our salvation quicken you to your understanding as we study this with you. Amen. Did you know that the Lord Jesus Christ came for the purpose of dying and giving back to us what we lost in Adam. How many here didn't know that? Okay, good, you know that. Jesus, in fact, is called the last Adam because he came to right or make right what the first Adam failed to do. The first Adam was to take dominion, have power over the planet and rule under God. But he failed and Satan came in and took his birthright from him. So Jesus came as a man, not as God. He, he was God, but he stripped himself of the godness so he could fairly deal with the devil on our plane, on our humanity level. Did the devil come to tempt Jesus? Folks, did the devil tempt Jesus? Now, here's a funny thing. Wasn't Jesus a creator of all things? Yes. Wasn't Jesus the one who created the devil before he was sin? Yes. Amen. So the devil comes to him, show you what kind of a turkey he is. And he says to the one who created them, remember, all three created everything. But without Jesus was nothing made that was made. It was made for him, by him, and to honor him. And that's including you. All right. So when Satan came to him, he says, if you be the son of God. Well, here's that lion snake. Knew his creator. He's looking right at him. But most people don't know what Satan was doing. Satan was challenging Jesus' humanity. His humanity. He just got through fasting 40 days and 40 nights and he was hungry. Satan says, you ready to trade it for a little bite of food? Huh? Esau, you want to trade your birthright for some porridge? I always love that story. His, his mom, this is cool, took some fur, put it all over his arms and hands so that when Jacob was blind, see, I mean, so not Jacob, but uh, his father was blind and went, went to touch him. Isaac touched him. He felt the hair and thought it was Esau. So the birthright's always given to the firstborn. But you might not know this. I like to study. But the firstborn was nothing more than a beast. He never quite developed. He was challenged mentally. And so the mother knew that. But the father was going to honor the covenant. 
And so the mother put all the fur on the arm and stuck him in there, and she, he felt the fur and blessed Jacob, not Esau. And that's a really wisdom to us. Are you living by what you eat? Are you willing to trade your Christianity over food and your selfishness? No, but Jacob was willing to serve God even though he was ornery. Now what happened? Jacob decided he was going to fight with God, remember? He fought with God, didn't he? He wrestled with the Lord. That was Jesus he was wrestling with, okay? And he lost, didn't he? But Jesus did what with Jacob's name? Changed it. Type and shadow of what happens to us. We were nothing more than a little better than a beast before we were saved. I was. Drugs, booze, women, rock and roll. <laughs> right? Look what it got me. It didn't get me very good. But, but God saw something else in me. And he changed, once I accepted Jesus Christ, my name and character and nature was changed. And yours too. Aren't you glad? All right, so let's get into this. I want to give you a note before we get on. We as believers are to grow up into him, being like Christ, it says in Ephesians 4. But the only way we can do this is with God inside helping us. For it is God in us who does the work. Even though our outward man perish, our inward man is being renewed day by day. It all comes with meeting with God. Key, okay? Now, so the power of God and the influence of God as ambassadors is given to a believer. Now, folks, how responsible are we with the assignments God gives us? Good question to ask. Find out how obedient you are to the Lord. That's very important because... He needs us to give us certain assignments to get done in the earth. Well, I thought God was all-powerful. Why doesn't he just do it himself? He never excludes man. He always includes man. So he's never going to do something for you without including you. Something for your family without including you. <coughs> in fact... It was your prayers that probably invoked him or invited him in. Are you with me? And so I want you to hang with me here. Now go with me to John chapter 14. So the power and the influence that we are to walk in as believers is a gift of God. Just like our salvation. It's the kingdom of God. Everyone say the kingdom of God. In the Lord's prayer it says... Our, Lord, Heavenly Father, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Boy, that gives us a lot of room. How is it in heaven? You see anybody cancer patients? In fact, right, something, something with you, Linda, Spirit of God's right here. Something he's destroying. I don't know what it is in the skin. So you receive it. Put your hand right there on that, or whatever that is. And you just open up and be a vacuum and suck in the glory of God. Okay. I can see the glory. I can see the glory of God bouncing. I'm not trying to put you on the spot. But many people come to Jesus and get what they want. Sometimes we think, ah, oh, Jesus is going to come to me. He just did. Amen. So you claim that, hold on to it. And we'll talk about keeping our healing. Are you with me? Praise God. You see, I brought Jesus, you brought Jesus, and where two or three are gathered in my name. So the one who's the healer is here. We need healer, right? So we have to keep welcoming, beckoning. So when you come into church, you should be prayed up and welcoming to God to offer praise, to offer our gifts, but to welcome what God ever change God wants in our hearts. Say amen. amen. And then we go, we come to church, enjoy one another, we enjoy the Lord, we leave changed. Something has happened in our life because we expect that change. Can you say amen? You got John 14. It says, most assuredly I say to you, who's he talking to? Us. He who believes in me, 
gosh, that's you and I. The works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. Now, most people say, man, Jesus did a lot of works. Who lives in you? Let's just put it Jesus. Is he the same yesterday, today, and forever? Yes. What the problem with, now, don't get me, don't get mad at me. The problem with us as Christians is we block his flow. Before we go to pray for somebody, we figure out, how are you going to do that, Jesus? Stop blocking his flow. God, the healer, lives in you. And he needs to flow out through your mind, and your mind doesn't need to be in the way. So you recede back your mind and let the spirit flow. That way, when I begin to move in the spirit, it is no longer I'm moving. I bypass my, my mind and my control, and now I'm moving in the realm of the spirit. So in the days to come, saith God, I will begin to move in your life like never before, but do not compromise. I have begun to share with you all the wisdom and the knowledge I am giving you, my daughter. So therefore, focus on that. And do not be pulled to the right hand. Do not be pulled to the left hand, saith God. But continue to follow me and be faithful. For you have begun to taste how good I have and the things I have for you. Woo. So you see how I step out of that realm? I didn't do that on my per It just step out of the physical realm into the spiritual realm. Well, you can do that anytime you want, everywhere you want, on the job, in your prayer closet. The idea is you've got to be exercised in it. It has to become that. I was raised in that kind of teaching. And I want you to be exposed to it because it says that when somebody moves in the spirit, it says the, the secret parts of men's hearts are revealed. And people repent and accept Jesus because you spoke to them about their life. And nobody else could have told you. We need to move in the supernatural realm because that's a realm Satan can't operate in. Oh yeah, he's a supernatural being, but God will not let him operate in the spirit realm. That's capital S. He's in an evil fallen realm and he's hid behind a lot of curtains. So in order for him to perform or act, some ding-dong has to invite him in. Tarot cards, fortune-telling. How about your horoscope? All opens the door and brings the spirit in. So it attaches to you. Say, God forbid. If you think you got a cling on, you get rid of them just easily. Lord, if I've got something unclean attached to me, I renounce it. I forbid it's ever to touch me again. I'm God's anointed. Therefore, I break its power. And in Jesus' name, leave me in Jesus' name. When you do, sometimes you'll feel something pop right off you. And you go, my goodness, I wonder how long that was there. And God will scratch his head and you'll say, yeah, it was bothering me too. <laughs> Folks, I had seven spirits come out of me when I got saved. It was like God ripped my ribs up like that and just pulled these evil spirits out of me. I had an anger problem. I had a problem with deception. I wanted to hide the truth. I always wanted to kind of hide the truth because I figured if people knew the, you know, the wrong truth, you'd be exposed. Well, listen, remember this. Everyone say, remember this. What we choose to hide, God will expose. What we expose to God, God, I'm a mess, help me. He will hide. In other words, he will cover us because of our nakedness and our sin. We go to God and say, Lord, I'm having a real hard problem with, with my life. I need you to help me with this. God says, good, I will. And he covers us. For us to run around, tell everybody we're together and we're lying, we're cheating, we're doing all that kind of stuff. Now, I'm not talking about little sins. I'm talking about you know, when God's dealt with you and says, quit, and you keep on doing it, you know. And, and one of the things that really drains the power off a lot of Christians is compromise. Now, you and I know it's not what goes in us that defiles us. Some of you like to taste a little beer or do a little, I'm not condemning any of that. But it's how we, what we bring out of us, what we say with our words. Have you ever called somebody a name and wish you could take it back? That's what Jesus is talking about. The bringing forth of the judgments and calling people names and stuff and making things and accusing. For example, people accuse and they don't know they're accusing. 
I know you're doing that. Never let accusatory stuff be in your conversation. Now, I didn't expect to talk about this, but just a minute. Accusatory stuff. You do and you always, you never, accusatory stuff. Get rid of it out of your conversation because it poisons how we look at things. Can you say amen? How many know the government is, our government, when we pray over it, it's good. But there's people that are not so good. So why condemn the entire dogs and all the government because a few bad apples? God wants us not to be caught up in that stuff. He wants to be caught up in him so he could train us how to re represent him as, as, who are we? Ambassadors for Christ. Amen. So, one of the things that we need to understand is eyes have to be on Jesus all the time. And that's why we meet with him. Eyes off the world. Why do we put our eyes off the world? Why don't we look at the world? What's happening to the world? Is it giving you a lot of joy to look at it? Of course not. But see, there's a difference. The world system's corrupt. But the earth is beautiful. Look at the waterfalls. Look at the beautiful birds. Enjoy all that part of the world. God made it for us. Remember your birthright. But the world system is Satan's corrupt to cause man to leave God, to cause man to give up, to feel like there's, every, there's no hope. People are even committing suicide because they're believing his lies. Look at Cain. Cain had a blue glue on his head, and he told him, the devil told Cain to kill his brother Abel. Are you entertaining things? That people hate you, people are against you. Don't do that. It's a lie of the devil. You need to be so caught up in God, you haven't got time to think about what the devil's doing. And anytime you need to be concerned, now listen careful, concerned about the devil, know that you have the power to deal with him at that time. Greater is he that? So now we need to learn to fight using the God in us instead of our just our words. And just our anger. That's why we don't rail on what we hate. I hate abortions. It's murder. But you're not going to hear me railing about it. Because that opens me up for attack. Instead, I go to God and let him rail on him. Say amen. He's just. He's, he's not biased like I can be. All right, let's go into this thing. All right. We're going to cover... These areas, you ready? Number one, we're going to talk about our birthright and then our rebirthright. Our rebirthright. You have a birthright and you have a born again birthright. Amen. Second thing we're going to cover is we need to be equipped, equipped in Christ. Learn to use God's equipment, not your own will, not your own knowledge. Okay, because God's equipment never loses. I mean, God's shield. Taking the shield of what? Amen. Now, did God showed me this morning when I was taking back, picking up Becky and we're worshiping God coming up to church. I do that every Sunday morning and, and we're worshiping God. God showed me the huge shield that goes up. When we say, Father, in the name of Jesus, the shield that goes up. And on the shield is Christ. Yes. It's Christ. So it says, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery... Why? Because you're lifting up Christ. And when we lift up Christ, Satan can't throw anything through him. Now, what we usually do is we step out in front of Christ. And we start leading the way. Christ is back here. Our protection's back here. And we're out in the open. That's usually where we get an arrow or something stuck on us. And then we say this a marvelous, smart thing. God, why did you let this happen to me? No, get back to where you belong. My place in fighting against the enemy is the same place yours is, seated in Christ. Sit down and let Jesus fight. 
The moment Jesus, no, I hope you get a picture of this. Close your eyes. The moment you sit down in Christ, Jesus stands up and silhouettes your entire being. And immediately, do you think the devil's going to continue to advance towards you? No, it's only when we keep talking the problem and keep badgering it and, and talking about it, we some, will begin to break down. And remember about the armor. Say the armor. armor. It's the armor of light. Okay? You can't see the light, but you're glowing. If you love Jesus this morning, you prayed, asked God to kind of fill you, you're just glowing. You have an armor of light that looks Jesus, like Jesus over the top of you. So the last thing Satan wants to do is come into a church where everybody's lit up. Think about it. Very scary for the enemy. Because Satan cannot look at the light. But see how religion has hid those truths? You probably never thought, I, I never did, that when I go to pray, God covers me in light. He covers me in Christ, puts armor on me, dresses me in the robes of righteousness. I never mentally figured that out until God began to teach me. You see, we can know a lot of things, but it never comes together until the Lord begins to open the eyes of our understanding, right? And begins to show you how it really is. As long as Satan convinces us that we're protected, but not all. And our Christianity is good, but don't expect roses. That's not what the Bible teaches. That's what religion teaches. Because, you see, I've had a, a tough life, and I love Jesus. So therefore, you're going to have a tough life. Because you love Jesus. You hear that reasoning? That's religion. Religion will make you live here for your God and not live like a child before your God. That was worth a million dollars if you'll capture that. Are you ready to get in this? So the third thing we're going to cover. Oh my gosh, that's the third. We are to walk in the spirit of authority. Not a... Not like a kid's guessing what God is doing. And fourthly, we will cover in Christ, we are more than conquerors. All right, let's get into this. First point, our birthright and rebirthright. Go with me to Genesis chapter 1. Oh, that's so good. Guess what I'm drinking today? Kool-Aid. Kool-Aid tastes great. Anyway, praise the Lord. Okay, so it's a mixture of cherry and strawberry. Just in case you want to know, can you taste it? All right, let's go. Okay, our birthright and our Genesis chapter 1. Now listen, this is God speaking. So when you see the word God, everyone say Elohim. Elohim. Say it again, Elohim. Elohim. That's the family name for God. My last name is Oliphant. Okay, that's my family name. Elohim is a descriptive family name of the Father, now the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All the rest are Elohim too. They're created from the original God. So sons of God, when you read in Job, it says the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came in amongst them. The sons of God is Bonai El Elohim. Bonai Ha El Elohim means little lower than the original God. Angels are made a little lower than God. Can you say amen? I know a lot of this seems like Greek to you, but it's really Hebrew. <laughs> but the idea is for you to understand your God. Angels were never meant to rule. They were always meant to support. Now, who's Satan? Is he an angel? Satan thought he was going to have this planet. God was going to give this planet to him. And when he found out that God made a man inferior to angels, but yet crowned man with great glory and great honor, he rebelled and he attacked, tried to attack God. Why? Because he wants his planet. 
He wants all the jewels, all the gold. This planet is full of everything you can imagine because God put it there for his man. But Satan doesn't want his man to have it. He wants to rule over his man. And you'll find out Satan's original goal was to take mankind and turn them into a slave race of miners to mine his gold and jewels. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. I kind of thought you were a caveman, Dave. No, no. He tried to reduce us to nothing, little more than an animal that can carry out orders. Now, how many know that we aren't a slave to sin, nor are we are a slave to the devil? Come on, say amen. But that's what he thinks. That's his entire plan. To control every nation, to control every program. How many know the devil's crazy? Come on, shake your head and say, yeah. So the people that listen to the devil, they act. Yeah. I mean, you know a tree by the fruit. So people that follow the devil without God helping them are going to do stupid things all the time. And if you give them money and put them into power, they're going to do stupid things with your stuff. Folks, Scott's a good business businessman. He knows better than to put an idiot in control of his business. Satan's an idiot. He's smarter than me, but he's not smarter than God who dwells in us. Let God control your life. Have you figured it out? You'll get up in the morning and not even be concerned. You know immediately when you pray, your prayers are being answered. You're not wrestling with guilt and condemnation because you are with the Lord a lot throughout the day. And he's able to keep you from harming yourself. Look at your neighbor and say, yeah, last time I was with myself, I kind of bruised myself up. You know you did. Now, you know I'm just funning with you because I, I'm a human being too. All right, you ready? So God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have what? Dominion, Dominion your birthright. Over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the, yeah, all the earth and over every creeping thing. Creeping thing. Who's the creeping thing? You see, everybody thinks that God didn't acknowledge the devil. No, he said creepy thing. Who's, there's a whole outlaw in the planet. Why did God put Adam in even a garden? To protect them from the outlaw in the planet. So that they would take dominion over the creepy thing. Didn't do it, did he? Now Jesus came and took a dominion over the creepy one. And now we surrender him and let him control our life so we win every time. Say, I'm a winner in Christ. I'm more than a conqueror. Now let me just tell you quickly. I used to work a secular job and make good money. Every, every week I'd bring it home. I would conquer. <coughs> Excuse me. I would conquer that week. Amen. And then I would take my money, turn it over to my wife, and she would become more than a conqueror. She didn't work all that hours, but she got the money. Folks, Jesus did all the work already on the cross, said it is finished. So why are you still trying to fight for your life? Why haven't you surrendered totally and asked God what he wants for your life? And just live it out with God's help. You'll find your life will come together. God will probably put a spouse in your life. you probably be, arrange everything a little bit better because there's less of you or less of us in the way. Smile up at somebody say, thank you, God. All right, so we were made to rule and reign in the planet, right? We have dominion over the fish of the sea. So let me finish re reading this. I just love this, okay. And it says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created him, male and female. He created them. Then God blessed them, 
said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and sub subdue it. Subdue it. From what? Get rid of this spiritual outlaw. Adam, I'm going to say something to you. It's my conviction. See if you can find something wrong with what I just tell you. It was Adam's job to cast Satan into hell. It was Adam's job to put all of these rebellion people into their place and take over the earth, subdue this earth. He didn't. So the last Adam, Jesus came and did what? That's why you have him in your heart. Jesus knows no defeat. He created Satan so he knows how he thinks. He knows how he strategizes. And if you'll be quiet and listen to him and really get close to God, God will show you his plans way before he does them. Okay, and let me tell you why. Let me ask you, does Satan, now be careful answering this. Does Satan know your future? Think about it. Do you, does he know what tomorrow's going to handle for you? No, he doesn't. You see, God's locked Satan out of your future. Only God knows your future. Why would God hold my future in his hands? So that you would come and visit with him so he could reveal it to you. I know my plans for you, say the Lord, Jeremiah 29, 11. Plans for good, plans to prosper you and not for evil. So we go to God and so he can reveal his plan. So that when we get up from our session with God, I just have a small session with every morning. I pray for all of you. I pray that if you have any odd against me, please forgive me. I'm human. Please don't, you know, go on every word I say. Forgive me. I make mistakes. So do you. And I'm not on your case when you make them all the time, am I? Okay. See, we're not supposed to do that. We're supposed to go to God and bring ourselves. Lord, you know all my weaknesses. You know all. And so take that time to let God be God. Amen. All right. Then listen to this. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing. I tell Scott this when he goes fishing. Take authority. <laughs> that moveth on the earth. Then God saw everything that he had made. Listen. And indeed it was. No, very good. That's clue. Satan couldn't get this out of the Bible. You see, some people believe God put that tree in the garden to tempt us. Let me ask you, is God that stupid? He doesn't know what we're going to do. <laughs> Let me share something else. Didn't God put his goods in us? Now, his goods don't fail. So God believes you're going to act on his goods and not your own abilities. So God does not tempt anyone. See, in the New Testament, it's more intense. James said, let no one even dare to say, God is testing me. God is tempting me. In the New Testament, where does God dwell besides heaven? In you. Why would God test himself? Come on, a double-minded God is unstable in all his ways. He doesn't. This is really going to help you relate to God. God is on your side, but he needs you to join with him every day so you're on his side. Because you have a rebellious flesh part of you that wants to sleep in, do whatever it wants to do. And, you know, God doesn't condemn you. He's, he's trying to get you out of This is not going to go to heaven. You notice this? Bod's not going to go to heaven. No, I'm going to be changed. You're going to be changed. You have Jesus in your heart. And this mortal be swallowed up in victory. So it says, comfort one another with these words. Don't dwell on what's going on in the planet. Are you with me? A couple of points I want you to realize. The original plan was for mankind to reign and rule under God over this entire planet. Two, God 
still owns the planet. But he subleased it to who? Adam. And Adam leased it to who? So because God has to keep his word, if I take my home, lease it to Chauncey, and Chauncey decides, hey, I want to go to Florida, and leases it to his friend, and his friend just rips it apart. I can't invite myself back into the planet I own because I would be breaking a law. I have to be invited back in. And that's why Jesus stands at the door of your heart and knocks. Because after a few days of no prayer, you're pushing him away. You don't know it. He knocks on you every day and says, let me in. Let me in. Let me in. You got a fear, you got to worry, let me in that area. Perfect love casts out fear. Who is perfect love? God is. And where does God dwell besides heaven? Start thinking God in me. Start thinking God in me. That kind of mindset. God lives in me. God should order my step. God should take the lead. He has nothing but the best for me. Not like that, but God will let you enjoy your rest of your day. You do something too for him that he asked you to do. And he says, all right, take the rest of the day off in me. Have fun. Go to the lake. Remember your suit. <laughs> We're to enjoy life. But listen, what Satan does is got everybody wrapped up fighting for victory and fighting for that and that. When you need to die to self, get with God and stand up, walk on through life, knowing that the one who created everything is in control because you put them in control that day of your life. Well, what about tomorrow? God will be there tomorrow for you. And you know what? Satan doesn't know what tomorrow holds. That's why he's always trying to come to your mind and say, what's going on with you? God's not answering you. Now remember what I always told you, Satan cannot read your mind, but he can throw suggestions into your mind. Don't believe me, look at Cain killing Abel. So therefore, he monitors your expression. He says to Carrie, you're nothing. Nobody likes you. Everybody hates you. And that's why your life's so bad. Now, if I entertain that, he's going to see that I'm believing this. So he'll throw a suggestion and watch you see if you take the bait. That's why you're to walk around with a grin that's on your face filled with God. So no matter what he throws your way, you don't react to it. You don't respond. You should have heard some of the goofy things. I always know when something good's going to happen because of the crud he throws in my mind just before it happens. It's like he tips me off. He's so full of pride. I can't jab you. I, I hope you believe what I'm going to tell you. God is not the good guy. He really wants you to clean up your act. He doesn't love you. And I could just go, and I think, I was just with him seconds ago. Funny he didn't tell me. You know what I mean? A voice of a stranger we will not follow. All right, you getting anything out of this? All right, let's go to our second point. We need to be equipped in Christ, filled and clothed. Everyone say filled and clothed. Now, folks, the Bible says that that we to be filled with the spirit. And we're going to show you some scriptures. But also talks about go to Jerusalem, wait till you be, listen, endowed with power from on high. So now we're going to see that not only they get filled with the spirit, but God puts his clothing on us. Can you say amen? Robes of righteousness. Our own righteousness of filthy rags. But God put on us a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Robes of righteousness. All right, so let's look at this. All right. Equipped in Christ, filled in clothed. Luke chapter 24, verse 49, please. Luke 
Now, remember I told you you have a birthright because you're human. That means if you're human, you can actually resist the devil when you're human. I remember one time I was up on the Space Needle, and I heard this voice. It was like somebody standing next to me. It was a devil. This is before I was saved. It says, jump. I'm as scared of heights. You could tell it wasn't God, you know. But I wasn't saved then either, but I resisted him. Nah. And there'd be people who try to con me into things and do things. I still could say no because of my natural birthright. But then you and I got born again one day, didn't we? See, what happens though, when we're a human being, when we reach the accountability, we die and separate from God. That's why we have to become born again. So when we hear about God, faith comes. And when somebody shares us about God, faith comes. And finally, we say, Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. I surrender. Be my Lord and Savior. When we do that, God comes into us. Can you say amen? And now relights our birthright as human beings, strips the devil's power, gives us back our birthright in, as a human being, and a rebirth right. What do you mean? We were given, when we got born again, a new covenant founded on new promises that cannot be broken. Most people don't understand that the Father God made a covenant with man through his son Jesus. Now, how many know God cannot bleed? And the highest form of a covenant is to cut where blood flows. So God cannot bleed. So he sends his son into the earth and become a human. So that he could take our sin, go on the cross and bleed to finish the covenant. So Jesus, the man Christ Jesus, bled for us, made a covenant with his father representing us and the father representing him. And an everlasting, unchangeable covenant was made in Jesus Christ. The neat part of that covenant is you and I can't affect it. Satan can't do anything about it. It's untouchable. It's settled in the heavens, the Bible says. Now listen. All we have to do is realize that covenant is there. So what are you saying, Pastor Kerry? We have to wake up, know that we are, need to be saved, and say, Jesus, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. The Father looks and says, now this everlasting covenant has given you an inheritance, a birthright. You have the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. You have the name. You have the angels. You have the armor. You have the blood. You have the word. What does the devil have? Nothing but lies. Remember, he's a thief, and the thief comes to steal first, steal you from stuff. See, you might say this, and, and I, I really don't want you to say this. Oh, one day I'm going to get the victory. I'm going to finally get my victory. Shut up. Jesus gave you that victory, and the saints trying to take it from you. Now get it right. Don't let the weenie take your victory from you. Be smart. Know the word. Know who you are in Christ. You're ambassadors. I remember when I first met Scott and a whole bunch of people in Montana. He reminded me of this. We have a Friday night men's thing. Every Friday night. Please come. It's when we get to share the word. I want all these men to come. We had a great time this last time. But Scott brought a remembrance thing of what happened when I went to Montana. We, I taught a little Bible study. And to make a long story short, first thing I did as I stood up and I said, I am Pastor Kerry from Washington and I'm here, you know. Boom. God what? God lives big in me. And man, people started getting healed. And that's who you are. God lives big in you. But you have to be confident in the God in you. Not, listen careful, not what the devil tells you. Confident in sharing Jesus. Be confident in sharing Jesus. No, you're an ambassador. Say, hey, everybody, I'm going to pray over the meal. You, sir, come here. I want to get you saved before we eat. Start taking authority over the confusion that's been in everything for so long. You're an ambassador. That means God's backing you. Woohoo! 
So listen to these scriptures. They'll help us. Luke 24, 49. Behold, I sent the promise of my Father upon you. What? Upon you. Notice that. Notice it says upon, not in. All right, moving on. Okay, upon you. But tarry or wait in the city of Jerusalem until you be endowed or clothed with power from on high. Say amen. Acts 1, 7 and 8 says, And he said to them, It's not for you to know the times and the seasons. I wish most people would get this. Everybody's concerned about where we're at and the coming of the Lord in the end times. And most people get it wrong because they're in fear about it. God's never going to leave his child with the devil to go through the tribulation. Tribulation was given to judge the world on the, on the treating of the Jew and the treating of the Christian. Why would God leave you there so that Antichrist would beat the tar out of you? God always takes his children away to protect them. Noah, Lot, always God draws away from the judgment of punishment of the evil and wicked. The righteous is set, stated, righteous is not punished with the wicked. Now, people might not hurt God because Jesus brings up in a situation where there was a tower that crashed and killed 15 people. Jesus talked about this. But they didn't hear his voice when he said, get out and move from underneath that thing. I have a friend I love dearly. He is, was one of my disciples years and years ago, and he was a tree climber who worked with my cousin Keith. And one day he wanted to climb this tree and trim this tree because he gave his word. But instead of him seeking God and asking God, is today the right day? What do you think, God? He climbed up in the tree, did all those roping and everything, cut, and the tree didn't break all the way loose and kind of bent the tree over like this and then flipped him back on his head and killed him instantly. I get called. I'm two doors down. The Spirit of God jumps on me, and I ran just to see if I could raise him from the dead. I'm going to tell you, why did God allow that to happen? That's not what God said. God says, I told him not to climb that tree, and he did it anyway. Hello? So sometimes we think God allows the righteous to suffer. No, he tells the righteous, get out sometimes. Get away from this. Don't touch the unclean thing. Don't eat of that tree, Dave. <laughs> you got to listen to him. He knows your future. Satan does not. Satan's hoping always you're going to trip up. You're going to go back into your old patterns. Do you know it was your old patterns that ruined your life in the first place? So if you're born again and you've dedicated your life and your business, your family, don't go back into those patterns. God, Satan runs a, what do we call it? A algorithm on your patterns. He knows that on Tuesday you do this and bump to do to tap to say, hey, let's have a car accident here the next day for them. They always take this path. They always do this. Well, the Bible tells us that we're born again. We need to be like the wind. It comes and it goes, but nobody knows where it's going to end up. So is every man born of the Spirit. John chapter 3. Are you getting something out of this? I hope so. Boy, I've kept you long, haven't I? Finally, we look at Acts chapter 2 and look at verse 1 through 4. It says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, that's the feast of unleavened bread. Okay. They were all in one cord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a mighty rushing wind. Now, people don't understand that the planet had God kicked off. The only thing that God was doing is operating in the Old Testament through the law and the covenants and the prophets. But when the fullness of Pentecost came, Jesus rose and broke all of the powers of the enemy. Now the spirit could rush into the earth and fill the atmosphere and every molecule that you and I breathe. That's what that rushing wind is. So when you get spirit filled, you might sense the breeze of God. But you ain't going to get a rushing wind because it's already in the air you breathe. This is the air I breathe. Take a big breath. 
Say, Jesus is the air I breathe. Your very word spoken in me. This is my daily bread, my daily bread. This is my daily bread. You see, we need to relax, settle down, and realize we're circumference with God. God has to get our attention for tomorrow to turn out good. And therefore, you need instructions for tomorrow and the tomorrow after tomorrow and the tomorrow. He holds it in his hands. Don't put him last. I teach God must be first, right? That means in meeting with him, in your study of the word, in your worship and praise, which means also your church attendance. It's not your option in the New Testament to decide how to run your life, even though you have that freedom. Because usually we choose how we feel over what we need to do. Going to church is a command in the New Testament, which means don't forsake the gathering together as some have. As much more you see the day approaching, encourage people to love the Lord and do good works. Hebrews 10, 25. Are you with me? Let's go to my next point. So not only you're filled, but you're clothed. And it says, when the Holy Spirit came upon them, they began to speak with tongues. Folks, let me just tell you this way. When I got saved, the Spirit filled me. But God wants you to be filled every day. Because when you go through your daily walk, certain situations drain the filling and the water goes down. So you take a little time out, meet with God to bring the water back up. Amen. Now, I like to keep my tank in my car no less than half, half full. Gets any lower than that, it's time to. I wish Christians would figure that out. Hello. Never get low. Any, any opening you have, the enemy will take advantage of. So you want to stay filled. The Bible says the will of God is be not drunk with wine where it's excess, but be as being filled with the Spirit. In other words, stay under the tap. Keep being filled. Keep being filled. You feel a little drain? Keep getting filled. Feel a little tax? Keep getting filled. <laughs> Filled. <coughs> no, we don't do that. Instead, we go, why, oh, why, God? How come, how come I'm going through this? And God says, because you're not praying, let me refill you. Everyone say, we love Carrie, our pastor. <laughs> I love you guys. Well, we need to do it God's way. Can you say amen? We just need to understand. And that's why we, God gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to help equip the saints and teach. You know, I got 40 years and some odd thing behind me. And, you know, all of it was good. I had some bad stuff, but I had some, all of it was good. I've seen a lot of miracles I'd like to share with you someday. Are you with me? Go with me to Ephesians 4. Look at verse 11 through 12. It says, And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. This is what I want, want you to get. For the what? Equipping of the saints for the what? Work of the ministry. My job is to give you what the word says, show you how to kind of walk through it, give you to God so God can train you so that you are an asset, an ambassador for God. Their church is filled with people that don't know anything. But they got a good program for the kids. I want to have a good program for the kids, but not at the, the stealing of the word. Can you say amen? I pray him for a, a godly man or woman that would teach our children the word of God and feels called and has a compassion for it. That's a big order. 
So join with me. <laughs> Amen. I just don't want a willy-nilly. I want a program sitting and working with actually graduate in their knowledge of God. Say amen, somebody. All right, let's go to our next point. No, please hurry along, Carrie. Walking in the spirit of God's authority using his name. We're going to look at a couple of nice scriptures. Acts chapter 3, please. I could basically t tell you about the story. Now, there was a place in Jerusalem called the temple. And at the front of the temple, there was a gate called the Gate Beautiful. And it was all decorated up. And people who were professional beggars, yes. like, like on the ends of the streets and stuff, you know, all work for beer, whatever it is. <laughs> I threw that in there for fun. This beggar was there ever since he was a child. And he'd been there when Jesus walked by him and all the disciples. But one day, Peter and John were walking by yes. in the hour of prayer. And, of course, the guy, listen to what he said. He says, alms, alms for the poor. Alms is, can you have any, a few extra to spare change? Okay. And Peter and John knelt down. And, and the man expected to receive something from them. See, when you come to Jesus, you've got to expect to receive something from him. You haven't got everything yet. But most people don't go to receive from Jesus. They ask so far away somewhere, run to him. And he says, this is great. He's expecting to receive. And Peter looks down and he says, hey, silver and gold I don't have. I'm, I'm making modern language. But what's in me, God Almighty, I'll give you. And he grabs him by the hand and he says, in the name of Jesus Christ, oh Nazareth, Rise up and walk. Didn't even give the man a chance to check it out. Lips him up. The man got up, started leaping and jumping. See, that's authority. When you're praying, oh, be healed. Now, does that feel better now? That is an authority. And that's what a lot of the church is doing. You see, my job is to lay hands on the sick. God's job is to heal them. I have the hand. He has the heal. That's it. God says, lay hands on the sick and they shall, they shall receive. So usually I can tell when somebody's receiving or not just by looking at them. They seem puzzled, haven't got a clue. And usually ministering to thousands of people, which I have throughout the years. I mean, that's not, it's just, you, some, some people are like praying for a brick. They're trying to receive here when they need to receive here. They're hoping instead of believing, and they won't get a thing. But see, the woman with the issue of blood, my bottom man, it's all these people that came to Jesus. They put everything else aside and put Jesus first. And when they came to him, they expected to receive something. So Peter and John said to that man, silver and gold we don't have. But I got something for you, son. <laughs> And that's the way I used to look when I was a young Christian. I watched my pastor heal people and do all of that. I says, I want to do that. So I started acting on it. I'd lay hands on people whether they got healed or not, Sherry. Somebody would sneeze and I'd say, let me pray for you. You know, seeking out those who need prayer. <laughs> boldness. You got to have Boldness. You have got to have guts to tell the devil, get out of here. I don't want to see your face back. Now, know that heaven's behind you. Know that you're indwelt by God. Know that you're wearing God's clothing. Notice that you're a glowing being, a city set on a hill that can't be hid. But we don't respond that way because we're trying to read the situation. No. You do what God tells you in the boldness he tells you to do it in. Folks, I want to tell you something. I wasn't more than six months old in the Lord when I raised my first person from the dead. Now, did I really do that? No. God in me did. But could you imagine what my head would have done if I would have just thought about it first? 
three people in my life God allowed me to raise from the dead. I didn't arrange it. I didn't pick it up. It just happened. And when God knows you're bold with him and you're bold to represent him, he'll see that you're there when it happens too. Because you're going to pray the prayer of faith. You're going to move in power and confidence. You're going to stop mamby pamming it around. Say, that's me. Amen. That's what we want. When God sees that seriousness in you, look out. Amen. So we can see that this man was made whole. Now, let's look at the reverse. Go with me to Acts 13. Look at verse 6 through 12. Again, I'll try to shorten it. This is about Paul and a sorcerer. Now, Paul's trying to preach the gospel, and there was this guy who was a procreus, or in other words, he's like a governor. And Paul wants to reach him for God, but there was a sorcerer. This governor kept a, a, a sorcerer with him. You know, it's like, it's like you had the governor and you had your little priestesses, your satanic priestesses that came along with you. So Paul wanted to reach this guy because the guy had a lot of influence. But when he started to reach out to this man, the sorcerer got in his way. Started withholding. Remember, the devil's always going to try to get in your way. Just tell him to get out of the way in Jesus' name. You want to know why your prayers are hindered? It could be that you need to refocus and tell them to get out of the way. Have you got children that haven't quite made the decision? Bind the devil and get them out of the way. Get them off of them. Well, how don't I know if there's a devil there? You don't. Just, just treat it like there is. I remember a good friend of mine. He's, he's pastoring today. And he gives me the call at about two in the morning. I said, I don't want to mention his name, but I said, what are you calling me this time in the morning? He says, I'm down here trying to cast the devil out of somebody and it won't come out. So I drive all the way down here towards the wording and, and this one lady and, and she'd been entertaining this devil for a long time. And if you don't know how to cast devils out of people, you know, you better learn. Otherwise the devil will just wear you out by entertaining you with a Hollywood rolling the eyes and spewing out pea soup and changing the color of the room. Oh man, I can tell you about manifestations. But when you're dealing with the devil, first thing you do is bind him and you tell him to shut up. You don't want to hear from him. Then you tell him to come out. And the devil will tell you, I'm not coming out. I'm not going to do this. Shut up and come out. Then you turn around your back to him and you lift your hands and you start thanking the Lord. Then the big angel of the Lord comes down and rips that spirit right out of him. See, because you charged it, you bound it, and you commanded it to leave. You have a covenant, so you turn right around because it wants to continue to engage you so it can stay. So you don't ask, the, only Jesus can. Don't ask the devil what your name is. <laughs> He's a liar, folks. He's going to tell you anything. We are a million. Forget about legion. And then if you engage it with your head, now you've got a, an engagement. You never engage the, the devil with your head. You just tell the devil to move out of the way because you have Jesus' authority. He whipped you 2,000 years ago. And if you even think of resisting Christ in me, God will grab you, Mr. Spirit Boogaloo, and chain you up and cast you into the dry place, and you'll never get out. How do you like that? <laughs> Just remember the next time Satan is harassing you about your past, you remind him about his future. He's going to hell. And you're going to be one of the ones sending him. Adam. 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 Retake your rebirth, retake your authority in Christ because you'll be with Christ when he casts them into hell. Someone say amen. amen. So Elamus, what did Paul do? He says, 
you evil person, you always doing wickedly, you always subvert the will of God, you shall be blind from this day forward. And scales came over his eyes. Did you know you have that authority to do that? So be careful. Don't be pointing your finger just at anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, let me tell you. I used to live in Des Moines when I was a teenager. Moved out here when I was in high school. Got saved. And then my cousin Bruce, another fellow named Gary Keller, we studied the word together all the time. Bruce is pastoring somewhere over by uh, Lake Wilderness or in that area. But we would get in our car and we would run around and pray over places and everything. So God led us down to Des Moines and in Des Moines it was a head shop where people had pipes and all that kind of years ago. This is years ago. And of course they were all dressed in black and they had a, a witch's coven in there. So we, Bruce and I got in, walked in, started taking authority over everything. There was a guy who looked like Mike Warney, Warnke in there. He looked at me and he says, oh no. And he ran out the front of the door. Now, the big guy with the big hood was behind the counter. And he says, can I help you? He says, no, I'm here to help you. I'm here to share Jesus Christ with you and take authority over this store. This thing won't operate. And he's jumping up and he's coming at me and he's jumping up and he's coming at me. I said, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. And then he ran downstairs and ran out the back. We had the whole store to ourselves. We went around and annoyed and rebuked everything. The, the purpose of me telling you that, it's not that you run out and close down the taverns or whatever. <laughs> the idea is you have authority over everything. We wanted to try it out. And, and my old neighborhood, I don't know, see, Chauncey's never got a chance. He's one of my wonderful relatives. Never got a chance to see us when we lived on 21st Avenue South. But that's where the third runway of the airport was in Des Moines. God had us anoint a piece of property that I got molested in when I was a kid. A bunch of girls used to molest me all the time. So you women don't talk about molestation. I probably was molested more than everybody. Who knows? God forbid. But men look at it differently than women. But it's still an awful nasty thing. Anyway, the very, very woods that I was harassed in, we claimed it for God. And guess what happened? Three months later, Casey Treat bought it and built his first church. God took a nasty place that was in my heart and cleansed it, washed it, and anointed it to put a godly man or woman in it. That's what he wants to do with you, ambassadors. You're here to bring good news and power of God and to not to take a back seat to the devil. Say amen, somebody. My last point. We are more than conquerors. Boy, I kept you a long time, but you can feel your stomach growling. All right. So it says, Romans chapter 8, 31 through 39. I'm going to read quickly. What shall we say to these things? All the troubles of the world. What should we say to these things? If God be for us, who could be against us? Everyone say that with me. God is in me. God is for me. God is with me. Now listen, I'm in God. Those are your four dimensions of power. God is with, God is for, God is in you, and you're in God. Any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. And it says, I love this, and then it goes on, and it says, And he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him give us all things freely? Say, I have all things of God. They belong to Jesus in me, and they belong to me in Jesus. So you got to start seeing yourself as you're in Jesus, Jesus is in you. You're in Jesus, Jesus is in you, instead of you trying to live for Jesus. Yes, you're living for Jesus, but if you haven't got the Jesus in you and you and Jesus down, then you're living with Jesus going to be about 60% you and 40% Jesus in you. And you're going to find yourself reasoning and trying to figure things out, which often gives us stress when we don't have to have that mess. And it goes on further to say to us, thank you for being patient and keeping you over. And he says, who shall bring anything to God's elect? It is God who justifies. 
Who is he that condemns? Everyone say it's the devil. It is Christ, yes, who died, and furthermore, who also was risen again. Okay, and even at the right hand of God, who makes intercession, he prays for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, or peril, or sword? The answer is no. As it is written, Paul saying, as a pastor, you see, you don't understand. I'm giving my life out to you. I'm not doing this because this is what I want to do. Heck, I could have retired, got a nice place in a nice warm deal, and lived on the beach the rest of my life. But God chose us to get this place, get it out where the church of Jesus, in this hour, this is the final hours that we have. This is a great place to come and get your gifts and everything operating and in tune. And then when more people come, you can help with them and everything like that. It's just one of those many places that God's got for the end times. Amen. So who will separate us from God? No one. For your sake, we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. That's me, see? We're giving out our life. Yet in all these things, we are what? More than conquerors. Neither death, nor life, nor principalities, nor powers, things present, things to come, nor any other creature will be able to separate us from the love that's in Christ Jesus. Amen. So you are more than conquerors and an ambassador. So you need to learn how to speak right. Constantly, I ask God, please allow me to be able to speak so people understand me clearly. That my words do not drop to the ground. That I can encourage people. Because it says if you don't stumble in your word, the same as a perfect or mature man. And I stumble in my words. Sometimes I, 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 I say the things I, I, well, what is it? It comes out wrong. I, I say it comes out wrong. Sometimes it comes out too much. Amen. So everyone say with me, I'm a child of God. My sins are forgiven. I'm a new creature in Christ. I am filled with God. I walk with God, and God walks with me. I am more than a conqueror. Jesus conquered for me, and then turned that victory over to me. I embrace the victory, and I walk with the captain of my salvation. Jesus is the author and the finisher of my faith. And he will finish my life, and I will finish with joy all the days of my life in Jesus name let's give him a big hand clap.